And I think we are launching. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you so much, Zlatko. This is nice to be giving this talk, um, in this exciting seminar series. Um, so today I'll be telling you about Hamiltonian density of states. So Hamiltonians are Hermitian operators, self-adjoint matrices. And by density of states, we mean the eigenvalue distribution. Now there are some techniques that I've been developing over the years, like over 10 years now, for calculating uh, the density of states or eigenvalue distribution of such Hamiltonians from the knowledge of the pieces. So if the Hamiltonian is sum of two terms, then if you understand each one of the terms, the density of state of each, other, each one of the terms, then this technique promises to be successful for a large class of problems by giving you the density of their sum. But to get to that, that's a very broad overview, but to get to that, let's start from very beginning without making any, um, start from the very basic. So suppose you have two Hermitian matrices A and B with known eigenvalues. So you know the eigenvalues of A and you know the eigenvalues of B. And you ask, what are the eigenvalues of A plus B? Now, an F minus linear algebra answer would be that you just add the eigenvalues. But that is not the case as, you know, that would be the case if, for example, they commuted. Um, however, in general, they may not commute. So it's impossible to answer without the knowledge of eigenvectors what the, what the eigenvalues of the sum will be. Now, but wouldn't it be nice? I mean, the reason this problem has significance is that many applied problems do have this formulation. So for example, the Hamiltonian that you see in Schrodinger's equation has two pieces. The first piece here is the Laplacian, and you can, and this is the potential. The potential is easy. I mean, it's diagonal in real basis, and the Laplacian is diagonal in Fourier basis. But and you know the story is the same in the many-body system. I mean that was the one-body case, but this is the many-body interacting, say, electronic system. So you have two easy pieces. Each one individually is very tractable, but when you put them together, it is a very hard problem to answer the density of states or eigenvalue distribution of H. And it's a very central problem in this case. For example, condensed matter physics, chemistry, material science, atomic and nuclear physics are all based on this. Uh, Schrodinger's equation and this formulation of the Hamiltonian. Momentum plus the potential. Now, an example of this, for example, is the Anderson model. It also has two easy pieces. So there is the on-site potential. So it's a cartoonish way of saying every one of, so imagine every one of the diagonal terms, the random on-site potential is an independent random variable, say from the Gaussian distribution and therefore G. And then you have this hopping term, which takes you from site i to i plus 1 and vice versa. So the on-site term is already diagonal in standard basis. And the hopping term is diagonalizable in Fourier basis. So it's also an easy thing. So its eigenvalues are cosines, and uh, the density of states is an arc sine, if you happen to know that. But the point is that these two pieces are easy. But again, when you put them together, it's a very rich, um, it leads to a very rich class of behavior. So, you know, it, ex it explains diffusion, disorder, localization, delocalization transitions, and charge conductivity. The many-body version also has a similar story. There is a piece that is diagonal in the Z basis, another piece that is exactly solvable. So you again have sums of two easy pieces. But the plus sign in the middle is the source of complexity. So finding a common basis for the whole thing is, is very difficult, especially as the matrices get larger and larger, the so-called thermodynamic. Now, yet another example is furnished by strongly interacting quantum spin systems. So this is an example of a quantum spin system on a line. So most interactions in quantum many-body systems are local. That is like the first spin, suppose the spin system, that first and second spin interact. So you have H12, then H23, et cetera. And D here is the number of spin states. For example, if you have electrons, D equals two, up and down. And you have this sum. And this sum is very easy if you focus only on k odd, so 1, k, 1, 3, 5, etc. That is, you skip every other interaction. So if 1 and 2 are interacting, so you keep it, and you forget about 2 and 3, 3 and 4, etc., then you can, since everybody commutes, you can locally diagonalize 
and add diagonal matrices so the eigenvalues of this piece um, is pretty easy. I mean, it amounts to adding um, diagonal matrices. Story is the same for each um, when k is only even. But when you put them together, because of the overlap and non-commutativity of the consecutive terms, the problem becomes very difficult, provably very difficult. All right, so now this was just to motivate that the problem, although it's impossible to answer without knowledge of eigenvectors, and it's actually computationally provably sharp PQ, BQP hard, which is like sharp P hard, um, it does have a very rich and interesting pure math history. Then I'm going to take a very applied math perspective to it and show you that indeed you can answer this question for wide class of problems. But first, let me tell you a little bit of a history. So Hermann Weyl in 1912 asked exactly this question. Given the eigenvalues of two M by M Hermitian matrices, so Hermitian means self-adjoint, uh, simply symmetric to matrix of real. So given the eigenvalues of two M by M Hermitian matrices, how does one determine all the possible set of the eigenvalues of the sum? So he clearly understands that the problem does not have a unique answer, but perhaps one can bound, one can somehow understand uh, where a relationship between the eigenvalues of the sum and the sum is. And this led to various, um, various mathematical de uh, developments culminated in Horn's conjecture in 1962 which gives you a set of overcomplete inequalities that relates, that relate the eigenvalues of the sum to the eigenvalues of the summons. Here I'm showing lambda i to denote an eigenvalue. So lambda i of a plus b is i to eigenvalue of the sum. And if you look at trace, you know, trace is linear. So trace of a plus b is trace of a plus trace of b, and trace is sum of eigenvalues. So the very first one is very easy to prove. The sum of the eigenvalues of the summons is equal to the sum of the eigenvalues of the sum. And you know, an easy application of Rayleigh quotient um, shows that the minimum eigenvalue of the sum is greater than the sum of the minimum eigenvalues, et cetera. But there are a bunch of other um, inequalities. And this conjecture remained open till 98 when Alexander Kliatchko proved them. And later nice work by Knudsen and Terry Tao in 99 based on Schubert calculus and honeycomb puzzles. Now, these are very interesting mathematical problems, but they're not very helpful for applications. In particular, the bounds that you get relating the eigenvalues are somewhat weak for sparse matrices, which are bread and butter of what we encounter in the physical world because of locality of interaction and tensor product. So it won't allow calculating, say, take a very humble goal of drawing the picture of the density of states on a computer and look at it. Does it have singularities? What is the support? How do the tails behave? I mean, these are the questions we care about in applications. So, so let's, let's define another goal. So the problem is in general impossible because we don't have the uh, states. Ramis, yes. uh, quick question. Please. Um, when we say sparse, um, uh -huh. I, I suppose something that looks sparse in one basis can look sparse, it can look um, not so sparse in another basis. So is, is there a notion that here? That is right. So first, thank you, Zalatko. So by sparse, I mean that uh, the number of non-zero entries are far less than the total number of entries. And I have in mind that in the natural basis, they're sparse. Or if you want to take another perspective, the number of parameters that go in to defining the Hamiltonian is far less than the dimensionality. Okay? Great. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So let's define, um, let's redefine the goal. So the problem is in general impossible because we don't have the states. The pure math results don't enable us to draw pictures. But can one calculate or approximate the distribution of the sum from the knowledge of the distribution of the summons? And I really mean an eigenvalue distribution. And I'll uh, belabor this point a little bit later. So we take a more humble goal and we say, well, you know, can we plot the eigenvalue distribution on a computer, all right? And this is the goal that we're going to make progress on today. So now let me tell you what I mean by density of states. Somebody, perhaps somebody jokingly, was uh, commenting that they're dense about Hamiltonians. So um, let me tell you what we have in mind by density of states. So if you have a self-adjoint or Hermitian operator or matrix, H equals H dagger, 
for mathematicians, that means h equals h star. And the eigenvalues are real and can be ordered. And by density of states, I have in mind really the probability density of the eigenvalue. So if these are the eigenvalues, this is the probability of an eigenvalue. And the area under the curve is 1, as you may be able to examine by just looking. This is about 60. This is 3 and change. So if you multiply them together, so this is 0 0.03 and change. If you multiply them together, you get about 2. And you divide it by 2, because that's how triangles work. And you get area 1. So we're talking about the real density, a probability density of eigenvalues. Now, there are other synonymous uh, terms and phrases, eigenvalue distribution, density of states, distribution of energy levels, energy density. And I say this because you may come from different backgrounds, and um, you might want to have an idea about how transferable these techniques are to your field. So density of states is a more physics terminology, but eigenvalue distribution is perfectly fine if that's how you want to think about um, this talk for the rest, for the remaining of the talk. Um, now, density of states is not everything. It doesn't give you everything. It doesn't give you, for example, discrete information about eigenvalues, but it does give you a lot. I mean, it does have significance for applications, in particular, the partition function from which thermodynamics um, is specified is the Laplace transform of the density of states in the limit. So this is the definition of the partition function. I hope you see my cursor. So this is the discrete case. And in the limit, denoting by yes, new, thank you, denoting by new of E, the density of states, it is simply the Laplace transform. And if we have a way to calculate the partition function or approximate it well, that may give us a way to verify the functioning of our quantum computer if we happen to have a quantum algorithm that approximates the partition function. Another useful um, feature of density of states is that they often hallmark phase transitions. For example, singularities in the density of state um, can signify a jump in, say, the free energy or other discontinuities that may be um, signature phase transitions. Certain physical quantities, such as, heat, such as the heat capacity, are directly a function of density of states. So DOS clearly means density of states or eigenvalues. Um, the way it looks uh, can quantify the physics, Fermi versus Bose statistics. And the behavior of density of states near the ground state um, tells you, gives you information about you know, whether you might have a phase transition, um, the thermalization, you know, how many eigenstates are near the ground state to which you can make a transition. Efficiency, efficacy of quantum annealing. Um, so there is significance in understanding density of states. So the problem calculating the density of states for, for local Hamiltonians is a very hard problem um, to do exactly. And it's actually impossible without the knowledge of eigenvectors. And there are not many techniques for approximating density of states. I mean, we have exact diagonalization, which is exact. It's not an approximation. Um, but it's limited by size. I mean, you can take maybe 10,000 by 10,000 or a little more. But if you want to understand thermodynamic limit, the boundary effects are inevitable. Moreover, exact diagonalization does not provide you with a formula that you can analyze in various limits. There is perturbation theory. But there, you know, one of the, one of the summons, A or B, has to be much smaller than the other one. And the one with the larger norm, the so-called bigger one, suppose A is the one that dominates, we would need to have um, its eigenvectors to be able to carry out the perturbation expansion. There are other fine-tuned methods, uh, like there are certain exactly solvable models or renormalization approach that give you the density of states. But there is not much on the market. Today, I hope to provide you with a new entirely new non-perturbative method that works extremely well in either exactly calculating or well approximating the density of states for a wide class of problems. That will be the subject of the talk. So maybe I can quickly pause here if there's anything urgent. Otherwise, I can just tell you about the method. And I guess for approximating uh... Or maybe fine tune methods would go. Um, I was thinking of how computers, for instance, do usual numerical diagonalization, right? They use like LED decompositions or SVDs right. or different, different uh, decompositions and approximations on those. Would that go under fine tune methods? Is that what you mean there? 
Right. So I would put, so thank you for the question. I would put that under exact diagonalization and numerical diagonalization. By fine-tuned methods, I mean there are certain things that, there are certain techniques that enable you to calculate it, like beta ansatz, right? Like if you have something that's beta ansatz solvable, you can get everything. Um, mm -hmm. But there are not many. And, you know, these methods are not, um, um, they're not, uh, robust against perturbations. For example, if you have a beta hazard solution, which gives you exact solubility, with perturbation, you lose everything. Though, you know, without any perturbation, for that particular model, you can calculate everything. So that's what I mean by fine-tune methods. Maybe a better, word, better phrase for it is case-by-case -case methods, things that work for certain particular problems, but do not generalize right. to a class of problems. So thanks. Yeah, this, was an, this was a good point. Yes. Yes, and we have a follow-up question already, Ramis, from uh, mm -hmm. Amir. Um, yeah. Can you share a little bit more about what you mean by non-perturbative uh, in this case? Right. Thank you. So by non-perturbative, I have in mind that um, we are looking at A plus B, and neither A nor B has to be dominating. That is, if I look at the norm of A and norm of B, it's not the case that one of them has to be much smaller than the other one like you would need in perturbation theory. I see. So you mean like the trace norm, for instance? Sure, or Fabinius norm. Mm. Um, for finite dimensional, for finite, finite dimensional matrices, these norms are all equivalent. But yes, I mean, uh, okay. imagine the largest singular value. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, sure. Should I continue or there's more? Uh, well, there is a question about sources for fine two methods, but that, that might be uh, something we can post in the chat later. Sure, sure. And beta ends that solvable is usually the integrable models. Um, and, you know, most of these are covered in um, quantum condensed matter physics textbooks, I would think. There is a book by Sutherland on exactly solvable models. So maybe that's a place one can look. And I'll be happy to talk about that. All right, so Zofka, should I move on? Uh, yes, go ahead. Thank you. So how does this technique work? When and where does it work? So let's get a crisp problem statement. So we have two self adjoint matrices, A and B. I have A plus B. And you can always do an eigenvalue decomposition or spectral decomposition. There are various norms. There are various names for it. So lambda A is a diagonal matrix of eigenvalues for A. QA is the matrix of eigenvectors for A. So this product together is equal to A, similarly here. And without any loss of generality, you can always do a similarity transformation. So I'm going to do a unitary transformation. Multiply the whole thing from left by QA, and from right by QA inverse, and define my Hamiltonian in that basis. So I have a diagonal matrix of eigenvalues of A plus what, it, what we're defining as QS dagger lambda BQS. And QS is QB multiplied from right by QA inverse, defined down here. I'm here telling you that they're diagonal matrices, lambda A lambda. Okay? And the source of difficulty is the relative basis, non-commutativity, as well as size, of course. And re recall that we think of lambda A and lambda B as given, and we want to understand eigenvalues and eigenvalue distribution of H. And QS is part of, is basically the essence of the hardness, as I'll show in a sec, as I'll show right now. So let D nu be the density of states, so something that integrates to one, what used to be the probability distribution of the eigenvalues. This is the object we're looking at. There is a world of possibilities. Um, the size of the matrix I'm taking to be m by m. So there are m squared parameters that go into defining the problem. Let's just focus on QS. And if by beta orthogonal group, I mean beta equals one. If you're working over real numbers, two complex, four quaternions, what have you. So the number of parameters that go in are at most beta times m squared, because these are unitary matrices. QS is a unitary matrix. And D nu is an object that is hopelessly difficult to analytically calculate and hopelessly difficult um, 
from a complexity theoretical perspective. So what can we do? Well, things would have been very easy if the world were classical, in which case, by classical, I mean lambda A and lambda B commuted, in which case QS would basically be an identity matrix or maybe more generally permutation matrix. And if you conjugate by permutation, these two diagonal matrices will remain diagonal. And if you recall, so at this level, the eigenvalue of the classical approximation is simply the sum of the eigenvalues, which is the sum of the diagonal terms. But from a, prob you know, from a probability perspective, if you happen to know it, great. If not, this is all you need to know, is that the density of state of the sum is simply the convolution of the density of state of the summits. So one way to prove the central limit theorem, uh, say for Gaussians, is that you know, if you have a random variable x that's Gaussian distributed, y that's Gaussian distributed, and you add them, you don't add the density of states. What is additive is the cumulants. And the density is obtained by the convolution of the two Gaussians. Um, there is another very powerful end that, so this left-hand side, the classical approximation is somebody everybody knew before. I mean, before quantum many body systems. And it cannot possibly be very adequate because um, then we wouldn't have so much richness of quantum systems. We wouldn't have quantum computing. We wouldn't have quantum anybody systems with exotic properties. Um, there is, uh, yes. Ramis, yes, just yes. to clarify, uh, so, so we make sure we're all on the same page. When you said sure. classical, classical on the left-hand side, you mean classical uh, matrices. Now, those, by that you mean M is a real valued matrix, right? Sorry, what is an M real valued matrix? Uh, M1 and M2 would be composed of real valued entries, right? Do you mean like two matrices, M1 and M2? Um, yes. The, I see. Exactly. Um, so I call them A and B. Or A and so, B, sorry, in this case. Right. I think in your paper they were called M1 and M2, but here right, they're right. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. In A and B, um, A and B just need to commute. They could even be complex or Hermitian. Uh, they would need to commute. However, in this basis, where you've simultaneously diagonalized, since the eigenvalues are real, they'll indeed be real. Great. And can you remind us why, why uh, capital pi, this matrix, is a permutation matrix composed of zeros and ones and not just an orthogonal matrix, a real right. orthogonal so, matrix? Sure. So we have this problem that we're handed, and it's difficult, right? Now, we don't know how to solve this. We might come and say, well, how can we approximate it? So we can define a new problem, a so-called classical version, where you take a diagonal, lambda, so remember that lambda A and lambda B are given, and it's the same for both of these. But you fake it, as in you ignore the non-commutativity in QS. And think of pi as just identities, for example, mm. which means you're assuming that they commute. So as an approximation, and that is not an adequate approximation, but that's one thing you can always do. Mm. Right. So I guess it's important to remember that the pi's here are just an approximation. Good. Thank you. Yes. So HC is a new object that um, has the eigenvalue information of the two pieces, A and B, but it's different from the actual problem because the relative basis, the so called QS, is now replaced by, say, the identity matrix or some permutation matrix, which makes this sum also diagonal. Okay. Gotcha. Yes, it, it's the choice that you took in, in this. Yeah. Gotcha. It's a definition. Yes, it's a definition. Now, there's another extreme that if we keep the same lambda A and lambda B, another extreme is, which I think is very powerful and is the central, is the central piece of this talk, is that if the relative basis, QS, were replaced, now I'm going to define a new problem, HF, the so-called free. If I put Qs, if I make Q be a fully Haar um, unitary matrix, okay? Actually, this is an overkill. Two matrices can be free even if the relative basis is not exactly Haar, but this is enough. Suppose I replace Qs with a fully random unitary matrix. So it's a unitary matrix. Um, so for any instance of A, the relative basis for B can be anywhere on the orthogonal group, okay? 
That's what har means, means uniform distributed load function. Then the corresponding density of states, the so-called free approximation, is also well defined. It, there is also a way to get the density of this sum from the known density of lambda and lambda b alone. And that's the free convolution, which I haven't yet defined. Well, I'm defining it here, but I haven't told you how to do it. And I will tell you in a second. But this is yet another approximation one. So part of, part of what I want to um, get across is that for many applications, and I'll give you intuition for when to expect this, but for many applications, the true density of states is actually well captured by the free approximation. That is if you were to ignore the structure in QS and just replace them with all random matrices. And for you to remember this before we get into the intuition, I even put it in yellow, all right? So that's why I wanna tell you about free probability theory and what it can do for you, and then towards the end, what it cannot do for you and how you can fix it, okay? So intuition, when do you expect pre probability theory to well approximate the sum A plus B? That is, this is well approximated by the free convolution of densities of A and B. Based on my experience and um, through many applications, um, the intuition I have that I wanna tell you is that if there is some randomness in A or B, so it doesn't have to be a lot of randomness, but just some randomness, in some, um, as you'll see in some of the applications, and that the relative basis QS is dense, is dense. That is like, it's not close to something diagonal or it doesn't have too many zero entries, but it's relative, relative basis is dense. For example, in the Anderson model, um, the potential is diagonal on real basis, but the Fourier transform matrix that diagonalizes is hopping is dense. Um, if you have a fully random problem, for example, here where Q is hard, that's already dense. Now, for, once these two are met, uh, in many applications, the free convolution gives you adequate answer. And now I want to tell you how free probability theory, so what it means at a more technical level. Then I want to convince you of its powers through showing you applications that may interest you. So in conventional or classical probability theory, random variables commute. You know, if you have an X and a Y, their product, Commute, that means AB equals BA. Sorry, I said X and Y, but imagine A and B. AB equals BA. And independence means that if I center A, that is I take A and I subtract from it its mean, to make it zero mean, then independence means that the expectation of this product is zero. Expectation of this product is the expectation of del A times the expectation of del B, and they're each zero because of this being centered. And if you want to understand the density of A plus B, you do not add the densities of A and B because for one thing, um, the, the, the total, the integral over the densities would be two and not one. For probabilities, you wanna get one. So these densities are not additive, but what is additive is cumulants or log characteristics. As if you pour your transform the densities and you take the log um, that defines the cumulant expansion and log characteristics are additive. So Dan Poikulescu, um, who's a mathematician, in the 1980s extended the notion of probability theory to the non-commutative setting and to an application non-commutative random variables almost always mean matrices. So matrices are the objects that do not commute. That is, A, B is not equal to B, A. That's uh, a fact of matrix algebra. And then there is a notion of independence or free independence, which I'm gonna give you a very simplified version of it. Um, so you would want the, cor you would want the uh, correlation between delta A, delta B to be zero. But what is the expectation of a matrix? Expectation of a matrix is what you expect it to be. It's one over its size times the trace of A, which is the sum of its eigenvalues. So if you forget about this expectation for a second, it's basically the average of its eigenvalues. And if the eigenvalues have randomness, well, you take an expectation. This one over size expectation of trace of the matrix. You can subtract the mean of the matrix from it, and then the expectation of these products would be zero. The condition is more 
technical, I didn't want to make the slide too complicated, but I refer you to this nice book of Mingo and Spiker uh, that has the actual full definition. Also here, densities are not additive, but what is additive is this amazing quantity called the R transform. So a matrix A and a matrix B, they both have an R transform, and the R transforms are additive. And this additivity is important because it gives you a way to relate the two pieces to their sum. Now, the next, the next slide, I want to tell this to the audience, the next slide is a little technical. I just put it for the sake of uh, completion and those who are more, um, have more background or want to see the technicalities or want to refer back to it. If it's too technical for you, just take a break. You don't need it for the rest of the talk. I just want to tell you how the pre-convolution works, uh, but it's not a prerequisite for what follows. So, you know, now we're facing this question that if A and B are free, how do you calculate the density of states of A plus B from the density of their summits? And that's how, what I want to show you, how the calculation is done. Um, but you don't, you don't need to know the details of it for the applications that follow. And this is a technical slide. So the input to the theory are the densities, and you take the Cauchy transform. This is a definition of a Cauchy transform. And nu of t for each one of the pieces, a and b, is the density of state of a that gives you ga of z. And you can do the same for b. So you have two Cauchy transforms, ga of z and gb of z. You take the r transform, which, whoops, by definition is this function, r of g of z is z minus 1 over g. Now, the key property um, is that if the matrices are free, the R transforms are additive. That is the R transform of the sum of what would be the Cauchy transform of the density of the sum is simply the sum of the R transforms of the pieces. So once you're here, you can undo your steps. So from the R transform of the sum, you can get G by solving this equation. And that promises to have the density inside the integral. But you don't want the density inside the integral. You want the density. And the way you get that is by this formula. It has various names, like Thomas Sikolsky and other names, um, which basically says, which, which says the following. So you take z values near the real line. So there's a branch cut on the real line. And you uh, take the imaginary part from above and take a limit into the real, into the real line. So that's the imaginary part of t is the real variable that defines your density. Your density is a function of real stuff. You take the imaginary part, and you take it to the real line, and you divide by pi. And that gives you the density of the sum. OK. So my plan is to show you some examples. Um, so get this, apply this to particular problems that you may care about to convince you of its efficacy, it, its powers. So first, let's return to the, the Anderson model that we discussed a little earlier. We have an A and a B. And our Hamiltonian is lambda A plus QS dagger, lambda B QS, like always. Now, lambda A is simply these diagonal entries. And usually, the unsight potential is random. It could be Gaussian. It could be uniform and independent in an interval, or what have you. And lambda b is a hopping matrix. Its, eigen, its eigenvalues are uh, 2j times cosines. And in the limit, it gives you an arc sine law. And the relative basis, since, since uh, qa is just identity, the relative basis is just qb. And qb is the Fourier transform matrix, which has the density property that we want. So there is some randomness. There is the density. So we expect things to work or give good approximations. And I'd like to tell you that um, sometimes the matrices are exactly free, in which case the free convolution is probably the density, is the exact density. But more useful is that when the dense, when relative basis is dense and there is some randomness, even if the underlying problems are not exactly free, the free answer provides a good approximation. So let me show you. And Ramis, I think we Please. missed a question earlier, and okay. uh, maybe they can clarify, but uh, maybe it's about the cumulants. Does it reduce to additive log characteristic in the commuting case? Um, the, you mean for the free? 
I, I believe so. Uh, yeah, so, so, right. No, I think I can, I can answer this question because it can only have two possible answers. Um, the one is that in the classical case where things commute, log characteristics are additive. The second question is that does free probability theory um, in the limits become classical probability theory? That is, the R transform uh, when things commute, does it simply become uh, log characteristics? And the answer is no. Um, it's an extension of probable standard probability theory. It's not a generalization. Of it. Okay. Nice so with the question. Extension. It's an extension. Great. That's a good question. Um, so, <clears throat> so let's see. Let's see how well probability, free probability theory does in this problem. I'm going to treat A and B as if they were free and see how that compares with exact diagonalization and other possible methods. So there are, before saying that, so um, what can you do besides free probability theory? You can do perturbation theory and exact diagonalization. There are two ways to do perturbation theory. One is that treat this as the big object and this as a perturbation, or treat this as the large matrix and this as a perturbation. And you know, depending on the formulation of the problem, one is appropriate and the other one is not. So in this plot, let's look at the first panel and not worry about anything else yet. So here, sigma, the variance of those Gs is small. So the diagonal disorder can be seen as a perturbation to the hopping matrix. And the red dots throughout the stock are the gold standard. So they're the exact diagonalization with respect to which we want to compare the theory. So these red dots that you see here are obtained by putting the problem in a computer and just getting the eigenvalues. All right. Now, the free probability answer is this black line, black curve, a black solid plot that you see. And it's working extremely well. And it more or less coincides. It does a little bit better here. But it more or less coincides with perturbation theory when you treat the hopping as the large um, as the large matrix, like you should. And you know, if you do the perturbation theory backwards, that is, you treat hopping as a small and uh, the onside potential as large, well, perturbation theory fails miserably, like it should, because it's, the, it, it's doing it backwards. But perturbation theory is successful, not as successful as pre probability theory, as you can see some dashed lines, but it's pretty successful. Let's look at the other limit, panel C, where now, the variance of the diagonal terms are dominating J. So that is, the on-site potentials are large and the hopping matrix small in comparison. There you expect perturbation theory to work well with respect to the blue dash curves, and it works relatively well. I mean, it doesn't do so well around the tails, but it does relatively well. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd buy that if there was a discount. Um, the free probability theory answer nails it, as you can see. And the perturbation theory done wrong, that is in the opposite limit, fails measurably like it should. But the truth comes out if you look in the middle, where sigma and j are of similar order. Then, you know, none of, we cannot treat either one as small compared to the other one. And the perturbation theory basically fails. I mean, you can see that if you treat one small, the other large, they both miss the red dots. Free probability theory captures it very well. Now, years later, since 2012, I looked at this plot. I was convinced that it should do even better. I wasn't so happy that free probability theory was not doing so well near, near here and near here. So I read it, the plots, and I can show you that you know the exact is again red. You can ignore the green, and the free probability theory answer in that regime is the black solid curve. It's doing pretty well better than appeared in the Pura. So that's one example to show you that how well it does across the range of disorder and strength, relative strength of hopping to disorder. And that's what I mean by non-perturbative. It didn't uh, require and, small and, versus large. And sorry, can you remind us when you say, so each sample here is a separate random draw of, uh, right. can you clarify how you do the samples here again? Good, good, thank you, yes. So to get a smooth density of states, a one-point function, you need to, um, so here, you know, you 
fix a sigma, you fix a j. That's all you fix. And then to obtain your red dots, which, which is something you want to compare the theory against, you need to do many realizations and average. Because otherwise, you know, every given sample, every given sample of uh, the on-site disorder may have some fluctuations about its expectation, about its true density of states. And for those to wash out, you need to do, you know, many. I mean, whether many needs to be quantified, but few samples to make sure that the that you know what you see is a good representation of density of states. Thank you. That was a, that's an important question. And here, that's what I mean by samples. I mean, hundred thousand is really too much, but it was cheap to do, so I did many. Usually, my experience is that like a couple of hundred would do. Now, I want to tell you about another application. Maybe I can pause quickly. So I can tell you another application, which has nothing to do with the Anderson model and just uses free probability theory to, yet, to demonstrate for you yet another um, application. So this is a joint work with uh, Oles Stanko, who is at the University of Maryland now. Did very good work while he was uh, my student at MIT. And so here you consider a clean system. By clean system, one means a particular Hamiltonian. It could be, for example, a Kataev chain or a BHZ Hamiltonian. And this clean system may not, well, it, it will be, let's say it's a boring clean system. And I'm, not, I'm gonna be vague about what I mean by boring. Um, it basically does not have certain physical properties that you desire. And those being, it's not topological. You don't need to know what topological matter means, but it doesn't possess it. But what physicists can do in the lab, experimentalists, they can derive, periodically drive the um, clean Hamiltonian by time periodic functions, see the step functions, and it's time periodic with a period tau. That means it repeats itself every tau. So this period here, this length from here to here is tau. And by doing so, the system becomes non-equilibrium by definition, because it's now time dependent. But one can engineer exotic phases of matter, in particular those that do have topological uh, properties, which are useful for quantum computing and have other interests, theoretical and experimental interests. There is a theorem of uh, Floquet block theorem that basically says if you want to understand the time evolution for long times, suppose it's n times the period tau, the full unitary that describes the evolution is simply the Floquet unitary to the power n. What is the Floquet unitary? Floquet unitary is this quantity, it's a time order of e to the minus i h t, but since h now is time dependent, you have to do time ordering and integrate from zero to tau. Okay, so it's a non-equilibrium system. And so this is a complicated object. But using this complicated object, you can define an effective Hamiltonian called the Floquet Hamiltonian, which sees from zero to tau. So you just let time be tau. And HF is simply defined by this formula. You take a log of both sides, and you divide by minus i tau. So this Floquet Hamiltonian can have topological properties and can be interesting. And by analyzing it alone, you can infer a lot about the physics of the underlying non-equilibrium system. Now, in every experimental setting, in any realistic situation, there's always a little bit of disorder. I mean, there could be some dirt, some noise, something in the system and in the setting. Um, so what used to be H0 plus V of T, will have a little bit of static disorder. So it could be some diagonal randomness. It could be whatever. So that is in this formula, H, what used to be H of T, which is just H0 plus V of T, will have another term added to it, which is delta V. Whoops, delta V. And if you're, if you're familiar, I can tell you um, why it's random matrix. And if not, 
you can take my word for it. But since this appears in the exponent, it will affect the Floquet Hamiltonian um, in an interesting way. That is, you have to do a Magnus expansion with respect to delta V, and it'll have with respect to the full Hamiltonian exponent. And as a result, you get your Floquet Hamiltonian that you had before, plus some corrections, which are a result of interlacing commutation relations between this delta V and this clean Floquet, this clean system, clean driven system. And these are non commutative um, 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 commutation relations. So the little bit of disorder you have here results in a very non-local random matrix. So it smears all over because of this perturbation expansion to higher order. Um, and previously, before us, this problem was only tractable either numerically or in the limit where delta V was extremely small and the period of driving um, uh, was zero, basically very high frequencies. Because then, you know, the Magnus expansion converges. But we could actually solve this problem across the range of disorder and for finite um, frequency of driving. And the idea is that, well, we noticed that delta VF is indeed random and is non-local. So there you go. We have an HF that we understand for the clean system with no disorder. And it gets dressed by some non-local disorder that has randomness and it is a random matrix. So its relative basis is fairly dense. So, but this is a result of a diverging Magnus expansion. We noticed that it had similar level of statistics as the semicircle law. And <clears throat> we modeled this. So this H prime of F, which is the exact problem, we modeled it by HF plus lambda times the semicircle law. Because again, this, the level of statistics were very similar and lambda is not a tuning parameter, but is actually just the expectation of the variance. And this is the semicircle law with respect to that lambda m. Now, like I told you before, if you have any matrix plus, say, a totally random matrix, so in particular, this uh, semicircle law has GUE statistics, so it has random unitaries as uh, its eigenvectors, free probability theory is exact for this particular problem. And I claim that it's a good approximation for this problem. But I'll have to show you that. So this we can do analytically. So the quantity of interest here is the band gap. So the clean system has some band gap delta. And the question is, as you add disorder or you make the periodic driving finite, does the gap close or not? If the gap closes, it could mean that you lost topological behavior and you're in the chaotic phase. And if it remains open um, and you were in a topological phase, it'll remain topological. So this picture you see here was obtained analytically. And so it was this formula. This is the gap as a function of lambda, which I remind you quantifies the strength of the dress disorder that depends on the finiteness of frequency and the strength of disorder. There's a clean formula. What you see here in black means so the band gap is normalized to go from minus one to one. This is the band gap for the clean system. And the theory predicts that at some value, some critical value, this gap should close. And the goal here means that there exists, there exists density, there are, there are eigenvalues around it. And there's a sharp point, you can, you can calculate the critical uh, value at which it closes. It depends on the original band gap and the density of stays near the band gap. So one physical, um, a couple of physical, well, three physical things that immediately come out of this formula is that there exists some, such a phase diagram. And what was interesting uh, is that this critical value is much larger than the band gap. And this was not known before um, since people did not know whether with a little bit of perturbation, these topological phases uh, are robust or not. So our work showed that indeed they're more robust than one might be skeptical. Of. And then, you know, since we have a formula, we can read off the dynamical exponents. That is how lambda closes. Okay, so this is a little bit, it presupposes certain physics that I'm not getting into because I want to get the uh, message across for the technique. 
But it's a good demonstration. One other thing that we calculate is that if there happens to be mid-gap states, so these are some eigenvalues because of finite size, we can also get formulas for those. So if there's a zero marijuana mode, it'll persist. And also analytically, we can compute this. Now the question is, OK, we computed these analytically for this model. How does that compare against the actual exact problem? Right? Now next, I want to demonstrate that. So this is when you take H0 uh, to be the Kataev marijuana chain with 100 marijuanas. What you see in gold here is exact diagonalization. So this is just putting the problem, Kataev chain with the periodic driving, into a computer and just calculating its eigenvalues. It has the zero pi mode. It has density of states everywhere. And what you see in white here was analytically computed. So we can get the gap. I mean, it seems like you, know, you go in there and draw it. We can get the gap fully. Uh, I mean, I would buy this. And there is a zero marijuana mode that we can get. And the critical value we can compute sharp. Um, and this is a one-dimensional model, but the method is not one-dimensional. There's a BHC Hamiltonian. The definition of Hamiltonians are down here, but we don't need to concern ourselves too much about it. They do have certain mid-gap states, as you can see here, for finite sizes. And again, our formulas are the white curves and white dashed lines, analytically computed. And what you see in gold is the result of exact diagonalization. So I hope you're convinced that it's working very, very well. Um, I want to now summarize and then switch gears and spend a couple of minutes telling you something else, which points to the limitations of the technique. Uh, but let me just summarize here and maybe pause if there are any questions. So recall that there is the classical approximation where the eigenvalue, eigen, uh, vectors QS is replaced by an identity. There's this free approximation. And the idea so far has been that if there's some randomness and relative basis is smeared, is dense enough, then indeed you have free convolution as a good approximation. So it's a basis in which one of them is diagonal. And Ramis, I think for the final part here, well, thank you. That, that's a really nice summary. We'll, we'll move at a slightly faster pace just because we're, we've come up on the hour and it's, it's sure. completely good that we're going to run, you know, 10, 10 minutes over. I think with the live stream, we're not as, we started about 10 minutes late and as we usually do, and we're right. not as constrained on time since this will stay up. So some folks might, might not be able to continue for the rest, the rest of this, but we'll Sounds good. have the video up and recorded uh, so people can go back and look at it or finish it up as needed. Yeah, great. And it's a good place um, because, you know, I, I told you about pre probability theory. Um, and this is basically a talk. And you can take away that message and when it works. But there are certain cases where even if you have some randomness, the relative basis is not like it should be. It's not dense enough. An example is furnished by quantum spin chains. Um, because I actually got into random matrix theory because of this problem. So suppose you have a quantum spin chain like I introduced earlier, and every one of the local terms is random. Um, so it could be a GUE, it could be a Wishart matrix, but local randomness. It could be projectors. I was at the time interested in satisfiability problem, but that's no longer relevant. Um, so here, we have some randomness. And if you look at the sparsity pattern of this matrix, so I'm going to plot the non-zero entries of this sum. And for, the, for, for h, let me see, for h odd, there are going to be blue dots every time there's a non-zero value. So this is that matrix h, where I took d equals 4, and I took maybe four sites. Um, and the, I took five sets. So um, I put a blue dot every time H odd has a non-zero entry, and I put a red dot every time H even has a non-zero entry. And this is how the matrix looks like. So it is heavy on diagonal, but it's not diagonal, and it is very sparse. Okay? 
So it wants to be diagonal, but it's quantum. Um, so we have our A and B. We have some randomness. But the relative basis does not have the property that we want. In particular, you can easily check that QA has, so if there's a local basis for H12, H34, so these are d squared by d squared matrix of eigenvectors. This product is the eigenvector of A, and QB is this product where there is a, one, there is a d by d identity matrix here, tensor eigenvectors of this, tensor eigenvectors of one after the next, et cetera. So they don't commute. There is this little bit of a, little bit of a mismatch of the size. And there's that sparsity. So, so far I've been telling you that just take the free convolution, but in this case, it doesn't quite work because of the eigenvectors. But what we could show, I mean, I don't know if you can see this. This is, um, it was showing on my end very well, but it seems like this quantity is truncated a little bit. So although this is not adequate enough, a complex combination of the classical answer and the free answer is adequate. And Zalatko, it seems like I did switch to M um, before. <laughs> so M should be H. Sorry about that. Um, it's quite all right. It stays consistent with your paper. <laughs> yes. And then here I call them, yeah, well, A is fine, I guess. But uh, so at P equals one, it's all the way free. At P equals zero, it's all the way classical. And we could show that the true density of states is a P convex combination of these two, two known ends. And that P can be analytically calculated from the localization of the eigenvectors of QS. So the technical content, what you need to show, what you need to calculate is the so-called localization or the fourth moment of the entries of QS. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that right now. So since the entries are, since, since eigenvectors are normalized, this sum taken over all entries of the eigenvector matrix should be M because every column is unit norm and there's M of them. And one over M times that is one, that's just normalization. Inverse participation ratio is defined to be M times expectation of the fourth power. You don't look at the third power because third power does not tell you much. It has these signs, you know, it could be plus minus, but the fourth power is the right quantity to look at. And the empirical mean can simply be seen as one over total number of elements plus the sum of all possible elements. There's M squared and you add the fourth powers. And you can see that the sum is one over M if QS is very dislocal, extended. We plug this, plug one of these, one over root M in here, and you will get one over M. So as, as size goes to infinity, this quantity goes to zero. And if QS is very localized, that is there's a single one and zero elsewhere, there'll be one. So it is a measure okay. of localization. Quick, quick question. Well, yeah, what, I guess we can see now, but how would you, what's the motivation again for the fourth, not the second power of the eigenvectors? Right. Uh, the second power always is one because, you know, the eigenvectors are normalized is always one. The third power is not very good yeah, because, you know, the sign ambiguity. Exactly, sure, exactly, yeah. exactly. So naturally, the inverse participation ratio, well, I, mathematically, naturally, is the fourth power, but also it has this very nice property that it does measure how extended an eigenstate is. Hmm. Interesting. Yep. Okay. Yep. I have a paper yep. on participation yep. issues for quantum circuits on something else. So from there, everything squared. So. Well, you see, yes. Yet That's another reason point. why we're going to talk. So. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thanks for asking this. So this is a one technical slide, then I can uh, bring the talk to an end. So the first three, we could prove that the first three moments of the exact problem, the classical approximation, the free approximation are the same. Um, and then we could actually show the sandwich theorem so that the fourth moment of the exact problem is in between the classical and free. So indeed, there is a convex combination. You can take a convex combination of the two. And the technical content to getting that formula is to calculate the fourth moment of free, classical, and the exact problem. That gives you that formula. Here, it just shows that it's between 0 and 1. 
And for quantum spin chains that motivated this problem, we could show that P goes to zero, which means like these spin chains are very well captured by um, the classical answer, actually, the exact opposite of what I've been touting so far, because they're so sparse in the limit, and every term commutes with almost every other term except from its two neighbors. Um, you can read more about this uh, already nine years ago paper. Let me show you some successes. So here I'm looking at five, um, five spins. The local spin dimension is two. R is rank, that doesn't matter. So the free approximation is the solid curve. The red dots, as always, are the gold standard. So it's the exact diagonalization. Classical answer is this. You can see it kind of misses. Misses the, I mean, they both kind of fail at the tails and also don't do very well. And the theory I just told you happens to have a P that's 0.53, and it nails it, right? And you can see that it just nails it. Now, you might say, well, how does this compare to other techniques out there? There are some, there are not many. I mean, there's Graham Charlie, which you feed at moments one by one, and it gives you some kind of a density, and it has its own problems. For example, density can come out to be negative. Um, and there's this Pearson, which is a beta ensemble fit. And if you use them based on the knowledge of first four moments, which is all we need for our theory, is that you see that the Graham Charlie does this, Pearson does a little better, but not so well, whereas the theory I just showed you does quite well. Last and favorite pic picture is the following. So here I have only three spins, and the local dimension is five, and so I have H12 plus H23. Eigenvalues of H12 I take into a binomial, so plus minus once, Eigenvalues of H23 I take to be binomial, so it's plus minus once. And otherwise, they have random eigenvectors locally. So I have a small spin chain of three sides. Classically, if they commute, you just add the eigenvalues. So minus one, minus one gives you this atom at minus two. Plus minus one, minus plus one gives you the zero. Plus one, plus one gives you two. Now, the fact that we're looking at the quantum problem that things do not commute kind of melts down these delta functions. So you have full support. I'm referring to the red dots now. You have full support here all the way. So there are, there are eigenvalues here, not just atoms. And the Pearson plot, I mean, the Pearson fit does this, as you can see. I mean, it gets the symmetry right, but I would not buy this, even with a discount. And the Graham Charlie also, I mean, I don't know if it even does better. It depends on your perspective. But the theory here nails it. And it turns out, as you expect, it's very close to free answer in this case. Is very close to one. So to tell you about the contributions and where things could go is that I've showed you a new non-perturbative technique for obtaining density of states analytically. And the free probability is exact if A and B are actually provably free. That is, there's that condition you gotta check. And in the limit of infinite size, it'll be free, which is the case we care about. We, we don't know how to do exact acquisition at infinity. And but what I wanted to get across is that free probability theory is a good approximation, even if they're not free. If you happen to have some randomness and dense relative basis. And even when this fails, there is still hope. There's this P convex combination that we've really hammered out uh, that seems to provide very good approximations when there's some randomness and some the relative basis is sparse. I mean, it has to be permutation invariant, but it could be sparse. It by no means has to be anywhere close to this. The theory works much better than can be mathematically proved. So there is many connected open math problems, and there are many applications. There's also a notion of free probability theory for products of matrices that I didn't have time to get into. It connects to S-transform. And that um, is very interesting for me because the S there is a notion of freeness of unitaries, and quantum circuits are unitary matrices. So the eigenvalue distribution of products of unitaries is of interest. So I give you some references, and I salute you for your interest. Thank you very much, uh, Ramis. Uh, this, this was a, a great and very interesting talk with a lot of details. I think the references to a lot of your works will also be in the description below. And we had a number of questions during the talk. Um, so I think that 
has covered it, unless folks want to post any more questions in the channel. This video will be posted on this channel, and so you can come back to it and review it after. And I'd like to thank you mm -hmm. and the members of the audience for coming uh, today, this Friday. Uh, stay tuned to the seminars. We will also have another seminar next Friday, and I think for now, uh, for the foreseeable future, every Friday at noon. Um, you can see more about uh, Ramis's work also on his blog, and I think he follows up with a lot of that um, uh, in many papers that come out every year, from what I